Hello? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, we'll start the next talk. Um, our next guest is, uh, he has been awarded for uh, the best uh, marketing leader in the Netherlands, uh, under 30, so that's something. Um, he has been working for companies like 3D Hubs uh, and Recruity um, that exited uh, this year. Um, so I think he's going to tell us how you can do it uh, before you turn 30. So <laughs> I really hope to, to learn something from, um, he's the co-founder and CEO at Reveal, uh, and it's Ferdinand Gutzen. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for having me. Let's see if this works. Does this work? This works. Okay, great. Yes, my name is Ferdinand. Um, this is super nice. Um, thanks for having me. It's the longest I've gone today without wearing a mask, so that's uh, really nice. Um, yeah, so like you said, I'm actually technically for a few months still under 30, so I don't really know what I'm talking about just as a kind of a, a disclaimer. Um, but I had quite a lot of luck on the way and I did quite a few interesting things over the last years. So I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned on this trajectory because over the last years, I've constantly found myself in situations where I'm managing teams where sometimes I'm even the youngest on the whole team and that can be a, an interesting situation to get into. Um, and I wanted to try and find a way to talk about careers in a way that can be applied to pretty much anyone, and that's really difficult to do. It's very different from the talks I usually do. I usually talk about marketing and strate uh, commercial strategy, mental models, uh, theory, and it's really easy to make 50 slides and just go through that in an hour. And then I started making this presentation and I realized, oh shit, I don't really know what to say. Um, so I've tried to balance a little bit the stories and the, and the concrete examples. Um, I never really introduce what I do uh, or really like talking about myself when I introduce myself, but if I have to talk about careers, I thought I'd just touch upon some of the things I've done in the last years. So most notably, I led marketing at a couple of companies that exited this year. Um, most recently at 3D Hubs, I was the director of marketing and growth. And in January, the company sold for $330 million, which is the biggest exit in the, in the Netherlands of the last two or three years. Um, in addition to that, I've worked with training companies, I've done consultancy, coaching, I started in the agency world, then I wanted to go into the actual leading growth and marketing world, and then recently I started my own company, which I launched a few months ago, and that's Reveal, which is a software that essentially allows UX and product teams to bring the data closer to their decision making. Um, if you're ever interested in the stuff that I do, you can check out my website, fernandgutzen.com. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn if you ever have any questions, I'm always happy to share. Now, when you're talking about careers, it, it appears to me that you're fundamentally, in some way or another, can't really get around talking about the concept of success. And defining success is super difficult because when you look at the people who've tried to define it in a, in a way that kind of is applicable to everyone, they tend to water down the definition so much that it doesn't really mean much anymore. And I've also tried to think about this a little bit. What does it mean to be successful? Because if you talk to 10 different people, they might have 10 different definitions of success. And who am I to tell you or to tell someone else whether that actually is success or not? And the conclusion I reached is that a really satisfying definition of success that applies to everyone and has real meaning is probably not even possible. And if it is possible, I'm not the one who's gonna figure it out. But what I do think is important is to ask yourself, how do you define success? What does it mean for you to be successful? Because we tend to define success in a similar way as the people around us, the people who surround us, our friends, our family, um, our colleagues, our nemeses, if you have nemeses. Um, these are the kind of people who tend to define success for us. We tend to base our definition on the world around us, and we're very much influenced by our upbringing and our social circles when we define this kind of concept. And the only thing I can really recommend is it's really important to just ask yourself what it means. What does it mean to you? Um, is anyone familiar with this concept of the Ikigai? Anyone? Hands? Couple, nice. Now, this is a concept I came across. It's nothing crazy new. It's actually a really old concept that comes out of Japan. 
but I always found this exercise to be quite useful. There's a bit.ly link here that you can follow if you want to download this template. I didn't make it, I'm just uh, using it. Um, and essentially what the Ikigai makes you do is ask yourself, how do you find the balance between the things you love doing, um, the things the world needs, the things you can do vocationally, and the things you can get paid for? And if you have a career that covers your passion, your vocation, your profession, that's awesome. If you have a career that makes you feel fulfilled on every single level, that's great. And then if you're dedicating a lot of time and energy into your career, that makes a lot of sense. But that's not really necessary. You don't need to build a career that covers all of these bases. It's just important that if your career covers one or two of these bases, that you cover the others in other aspects of your life, whether that's the activities, the hobbies, the passions, the people that you hang out with outside of your work. I think it's really difficult to take a concept like your career, your work, and to just look at it in an isolated form. You need to look at how does it play a role in your life overall. And this is a nice canvas that I found can help you think about it. I think if you do this once every year, just think about, hey, what do I really want? What does success mean to me? It changes the way you think about certain decisions. It changes the way that you choose the jobs you want to apply for, you choose the directions you want to go into. It's, it can have a really big impact in that respect. Now, the second one, and this sounds like a little bit of bullshit because you can't really control this all the time, is choose the right company. And um, this is something I found over and over again, especially in the tech world, the startups and the scale-up world. If you choose the right company, you will grow with it. And if you choose the wrong company, you will struggle in a lot of aspects. So you could struggle in a lot of aspects. So just to get an example, I want to use an analogy here. Who here knows John Travolta? Not personally. Like, OK, who here thinks he's a good actor? Okay, who here thinks Tom Hanks is better than John Travolta? Okay, what's quite interesting is if you talk to someone like Quentin Tarantino, he would say John Travolta is one of the greatest actors of all time. It's why he wanted him to play in Pulp Fiction. And he's played in some great movies, Pulp Fiction and Grease, but John Travolta has played in some freaking awful movies as well. He's had a lot of box office flops. And what's interesting is, if you look at John Travolta, he was offered the main role of Green Mile, and he turned it down and it went to Tom Hanks. He was offered the main role in Apollo 13, and he turned it down, and it went to Tom Hanks. And he was even offered the role of Forrest Gump in Forrest Gump, which he turned down, and it went to Tom Hanks. How they are not sworn enemies, I don't know. But it just gives you an example that the, the roles that these actors play also define how we perceive them. Tom Hanks has been in so many amazing movies, and we can argue, is he the greatest of all time? Is he that much better than any other actor who would have filled those roles? Maybe. But the fact that he's played in so many amazing movies brings us to a point where we think, oh wow, if Tom Hanks is in it, it must be great. Whereas re recently there was that film, I don't even know what it's called anymore, with the, where he talks, he's the, plays the newsreader uh, who walks around different times. It was incredibly boring. I thought it was gonna be amazing because it had Tom Hanks in it, but it wasn't. And this is kind of how the kind of roles you choose can define how people perceive you, can define the opportunities you get in the future. And this isn't about necessarily picking the biggest name or biggest company. It's just picking the right kind of role that really suits and plays to your strengths and really helps you in the specific goals you have can make a big difference. And of course, you know, John Travolta is super successful. So, you know, like I'm standing here and John Travolta is probably in some mansion somewhere. So I'm not here to say that he's not. It's just to say the difference in the roles you pick can be really big. And this is where it really matters what companies you choose. If I talk about oh, people come up and say, how did you manage to help companies towards two exits? It's basically I pick companies that were really good. I pick a company that was really successful and I got to join for the ride. Did I work hard? Yes. Did I bring something to the table? Sure. But at the end of the day, I could have done everything I did at recruiting and 3D hubs at another company that wasn't successful. It would have been exactly the same situation. So picking the right kind of company, and that doesn't, like I say, mean picking the biggest. Half of you probably haven't heard of Recruity or 3D hubs before. But if you talk to people in the manufacturing industry or people in the recruitment tech industry, they've all heard of them. And that's a very particular positioning that, for my career, made a lot of sense. You need to find that equivalent for you. If you're working data science and AI, what are the companies that currently come, others point at and say, these guys are doing it right? This is something that I always wanted to think about, is how do you pick a company that is really good in the particular things that you want to improve in? Because that's always going to challenge you and help you grow. Now, another one, and this is the most contentious point, is know how to sell yourself. And I'm going to start with this quote here by Susan Harrow, who's an author. It's actually the title of a book, which is, you can sell yourself without selling your soul. So I'm not saying, like, sell yourself literally. I'm not saying that you should lie about yourself. But what I see very, very often, I've interviewed probably upwards of 500 candidates for dozens, if not hundreds, of roles over the last years, that people come in, and I have to force them to tell me why they're good. 
They come in and th they have so many awesome things to talk about, but they don't talk about it. And it's really important to know what are you trying to achieve and how do you present yourself? How do you present yourself in an interview? How do you present yourself in a negotiation, in a partnership meeting? It doesn't really matter. It's really important to know what are you awesome at, what makes you awesome, and how do you, how do you communicate that in an effective way? And we see this a lot in interview processes, and we see it a lot on LinkedIn and on CVs. I'm going to use LinkedIn as the main example here. It's really important to just bring home the points that make you you. So I have a couple of do's and don'ts from my experience. Also, having worked at a company like Recruity, we saw how every major company in the world basically hires. And we could see what is the process they use, how much time do they spend looking at your CV, how often do they reject candidates at the first or second or last stages. And there was just some things we noticed. And the first one is don't pick lots of job titles. It's tempting to say that you're a UX designer slash product manager slash product designer slash brand manager slash creative director. And sure, all of those have some similar um, skills in common, but it's really important that you just pick, if you're applying for jobs especially, pick one thing, the one thing that you do, and if it has to be some overlap or some hybrid role, that's fine, but pick the thing that you want to be awesome at and make that the thing that you do. When people have too many job descriptions, it's very tough. It's like you see it a lot with people earlier in their career. Who's, who here is kind of like in the first couple of years of their career, just to get an idea? Yes, we see this very often where you don't really know what you want to do yet, and you apply to 10 or 12 roles that are three or four of them are completely different. One is customer success, and one is marketing, and one is content, and they all sound kind of similar, but for the people hiring for those roles, they are very different. And I'm sure when you're very early in your career and it's your first job, you're looking for an internship or a traineeship, it doesn't really matter. But when you're further down the line and you're applying for a very particular role and your CV is either neutral, as in you've made it not descript to a particular role or skill set, or it mentions too many different roles or different ideas, it can actually be detrimental to you in the long run. Same thing when talking about your past experience. Talk about what's relevant. I see people mentioning their hobbies all the time. I think it's great if you have hobbies. And I think most recruiters will actually tell you, put your hobbies on the CV, but I can tell you for a fact, most of them don't read it. And if the hobby is relevant to the industry, you're going to a travel company, you're applying for a travel uh, industry company, and you've traveled a lot, great. You're going for a translation company, you speak a lot of languages, great. Um, you're going to a, com a company for a sales role and you do competitive sports, great. If there's a relevance, you have to ask yourself, what, am I, what does this say about me that helps with this role? When people say, I like to do puzzles and I read books, like nobody cares that you read books, because most people don't even read as many books as they say. And reading books is not really a hobby. It's not even specific enough. So it's really important to be specific about what is my past experience and what does it say about me that's relevant to this role? That's the first. And the second, if you don't have too much experience to draw from, if you're earlier in your career or you're making a switch, talk about the things in your life that show that you're passionate. Because what I get is sometimes people applying for a role and they say, my passion is marketing. I've wanted to do marketing my entire life. I love marketing, I love this shit. And then I go like, well, what else? you don't really have much experience. What else have you done? Have you helped promote your friend's band? Or have you made posters when you were a kid for some, uh, I don't know, some, some, some school event? Well, what are the things that show me that you really love it? Because people who love something behave a certain way, and if that doesn't show, you need to find a way to compensate that. Take online courses. There's tons of free online courses you can take. There's all kinds of things you can do to show that you're interested in this, even if you don't have a lot of experience. And the other thing is, like, avoid job titles. I feel bad because I think I've seen a couple of people who have this, but don't call yourself a ninja. Just don't. You're not a ninja. Really, really not. Um, you, and don't call yourself profit. You'd be, you'd be surprised people call themselves, I'm the growth profit or the sales profit. Worst thing ever. And to be honest, personally, I don't even like when people call themselves a strategist because nine out of 10 strategists don't know what the hell they're talking about. Doing strategy at company X is one thing, but being the growth strategist, and I, I used to have that in my CV, growth strategist, marketing strategist. And then I saw some of the people that I looked up to say, we don't like that word at all because it's way too nondescript. It really is this thing that people go to when they don't know what else to say. So I took it out again because I felt a little bit sheepish about it. And then, yeah, finally, don't force it. This is really important. So I can give you a lot of things that I've seen work or don't work. Every situation is different. Every country is different. Every company is different. You should never do something that isn't you. I think that's really important. So look at these do's and don'ts with the lens of who are you and what are you comfortable doing? Because you shouldn't sell yourself as differently than who you are. That's really important. So it's a fine balance to find. 
Then some of the do's, things that I found can help. Position yourself. What is it you do and what is unique about it? If you're doing marketing, do you do marketing for SaaS products or e-commerce? If you do development, what are the languages that you are most proficient in? I can't believe how many developer CVs I get. Okay, for developers, it doesn't matter. You're always going to get a job because there's not enough developers. So you guys probably don't need this talk. But at the end of the day, how many developers do I get who don't mention what languages they can do? Um, or talking about, hey, I'm code agnostic, or I have a general understanding of tech beyond the individual language that I speak, or I care about architecture, and we, we don't get all of this information, so it's really good to position yourself. What, what, what makes you really good at a specific thing? And most of you will have that. If you, even if it's not on your LinkedIn or your CV, if you think about it, what is the thing I've done? I'm good at this industry, or I'm good at this technology, or I'm good with this kind of company. I'm good with companies, you know, I'm good at zero to one. I'm good at the companies that are brand new and just trying to get their first revenue. Find the thing, find the red thread that goes through your past experience and make that your thing. Also talk concretely about achievements. You know, we don't want to, a lot of people feel uncomfortable bragging and I don't suggest you should do it if you don't want to, but it's good to talk about the things you've achieved, even if it's sometimes uncomfortable. Because if you've had success and you say we've done this and we've had concrete results, share them because that makes companies know that you've done it before. Most of the time, when a company is hiring for a more senior role, they're looking for someone who's done what they're trying to do. We're trying to expand to Germany. Let's find someone who's expanded to Germany before. These are the kind of roles they look for. So share the results you've had, share the experiences you've had. And then finally, make sure it's well written. Put detail into the profile. I'll give an example. I've used my own one here, not because I want to be, so, be crazy egotistical, but I didn't want to take anyone else's profile and just highlight it to the world. But essentially, I try to highlight the key things that kind of summarize my career. And most importantly, I take out all of those one month jobs I had, one month interning here or one month helping out here. It's nice to have those, but once you have a few years of experience, it's good to have a clean story. So for me, it's I went from an agency to a training company and from a training company to leading growth at one company that grew really fast. I went to another company with funding and then I started my own business. It's a very clean trajectory. And there was all kinds of crappy things in between and some of those things were really cool, but I still take it out because I want to tell a clean story. I want to tell a simple story about what I've done. And I always talk about what have I done and what were the results? Because when you can share results, do share results. If you don't have results, that's okay. You don't have to be crazy experienced to do this, but do talk about the things you've achieved, the things that really helped. Don't say things like, I'm good at teamwork. That doesn't mean anything. Everyone can say they're good at teamwork. I'm good at Microsoft Office. Pfft, not even, at least Google Docs, but not even that. If that's on your CV, go on your phones right now. I don't care if you're not even listening anymore and take it out. Because these things are not skills that people care about. But talk about specific things. For example, I've worked at companies where the stakeholders are very close to the, to, to, the, to the more junior positions, and I had to manage stakeholders through various projects. That's a specific thing they want to know you're able to do. These are the kind of things. I've worked with people from different multidisciplinary skill sets to bring together projects that have different aspects and different moving parts. Of course, you can make it less wordy than what I just said, but it's good to be specific. And the important thing is to always keep learning. This is something that everyone will probably agree with, but it's important to think about how you're learning. So there's this great quote, or it's not really a quote, it's a bit of a mouthful, but there's this concept by Scott Adams, and he's a blogger, and he basically said, if you want to have a good career, basically if you're smart and you work hard and you pick a couple of the right companies, you're going to do well for yourself. If you want to be extraordinary, there's two things you can do. You can either be the best at one thing, which means you specialize, I'm the best at this specific thing, or you're gonna have to be top 25% of two or three things. You take the generalist route. Because people who are specialists tend to look down on people who are generalists, people who are generalists maybe look down on people who are specialists, I don't know, we always tend to have different opinions on this, but the reality is you can be successful with both. You can be a successful generalist and you can be a successful specialist. But when I get an application from someone in marketing who says, I do paid ads and SEO and conversion rate optimization and data analysis and copywriting and design and HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and I'm also really good with website builders plus Microsoft Office, it's too many things. Like, I know you're not going to be even top 25%, not even top 80%. I want to know what are the two or three things that you really do well, because it's not that I'm not going to hire you. If I say I want an SEO expert and they do something completely different, like they're a dance teacher, sure, maybe that doesn't fit. But if I say I want a general marketing person or a general HR person, and you say, okay, I do these two or three things really well, that's okay. You, no one's great at everything. So it's always good to pick the things you're best at and to then be honest about it and say, well, the first thing I would do is hire someone or work with a freelancer or help you hire someone who can help complement the other side of it. 
I think these are the kind of things that people usually fall, tend, tend to overdo a little bit. I made this, uh, this is very marketing specific, the, the orange part, but I made this kind of skill matrix where there's different kinds of skills you can learn. There's foundational skills, which is the kind of skills that are gonna help everyone in any given kind of role if you're working for a tech company, for example. There's company specific skills, which is knowing the company, the culture, the vision, the brand, understanding the market, understanding the target user. And then at the bottom, you have the strategic skills, which is what are the things that help you once you start moving up in seniority in a company. And then in the middle, you have this orange layer, which is all of these in very specialized, specific marketing skills. And these are the skills where you need to pick, am I going to be the best at one of them? Or, or am, I gonna, am I going to try to be amazing at one? Or quite good at multiple? And it's important that you really think about that. You don't have to make that decision on day one of your career, but it's good to start thinking about that because you can start gearing your CV, your learnings, your courses you take, the talks you attend, you can start gearing it around that decision. So if you're gonna go more into management, you're probably gonna take more of a generalist profile as you go. That's usually what happens. If you want to be a manager and you wanna run a team with lots of different skills, having a good understanding at a large range of skills can be very beneficial. But if you're going to become the lead implementation specialist in this particular technology, it's probably better for you to specialize and to make sure that you learn the skills in line with that. And we see this all the time. I see all the time developers who are at early stage companies. Who here is a developer? Okay, we've got a few. I see this all the time. Developers who are early stage company and they really want to code. And then the company needs kind of dev lead or a head of development. And they go, oh, come on, do it. And they're like, no, I don't really want to do it. And they just do it, just do it, you'll be great. And then they end up on this management track, even though they're a specialist. And it very rarely ends up going super well. And it works the other way around as well. The next one is to create opportunities. And I think this is ultimately when we're talking about startups and scale-ups. I think the first four points here apply to most companies you could apply for. But this fifth one is really what separates startups from corporates, which is that a startup is super volatile. It's basically, we talk about, you know, it's like taking a plane, taking it off the cliff, and having to build the plane while you're falling off the cliff. That's essentially life of a startup. Every week I think my startup's gonna be fail and then I celebrate the latest success and then I think it's gonna fail. I've almost filed for bankruptcy three times in the last three months. So that's just the life of a startup. And that comes with really specific challenges. It's hectic, it's overbearing, you're constantly having to do more than you can handle, it's stressful, but it also comes with opportunities, which is that lack of structure creates opportunity. You can take ownership more quickly. You can, talk to, you can walk up to the CEO and talk to the CEO. Try that at Microsoft or Google, it doesn't work. Well, unless you're really, really senior, then you can do it. But generally, that's more difficult to do. And there, there are these really uh, precise differences. It's just you have to choose basically this volatility and opportunity and you know, high risk, high reward versus this kind of low risk and still potentially high reward, but it's a slower reward. You're not gonna become a, you're not gonna become a C-level or a director or a head within one or two years at a corporate, but at a startup you can. And it's, uh, it, it comes with its challenges. And I think these are kind of the core things that I kind of take out from my experience, which is you need to take full ownership. If you don't take ownership over what you're doing, it's really hard to succeed in a startup. No one's there to hold your hand. No one's there to help you. They throw you in the deep and you're gonna have to figure out how to swim. That's essentially the life of a startup. The other thing is things are unstructured and chaotic. And this happens all the time. When I, have, when I hire people who come from bigger companies and they come into the startup world, they feel this need to tick off all the tasks. You know, I have these 20 things I know I need to do. I'm trying to get to the, it's like every task is a pile of papers and they're trying to zero the pile. In a, in a, in a startup, you're never gonna zero the pile because by the time you've gotten halfway through, they've added another double the amount on top. And that's okay, you don't need to zero the pile because you just need to follow the top 10 prioritized actions and deliver on them consistently and eventually the company will grow and then you'll hire people to zero the pile. Once, and that's, by that point, you're probably not a startup anymore. You will constantly learn new things, so learning fast is really important, but ultimately, and this is what I think really makes the difference, when you're at a startup, your fate to some extent is tied to the success of the team and the company. And this is something that being too individualistic in a, in a startup is not a good thing because you need to help the team grow. You need to help the company be successful because of course, picking the right company is important, and there will be luck factors. You know, if you joined a travel startup before, one month before the pandemic, then you're shit out of luck. That happens, and it works the other way around. If you joined a crypto exchange the day before blockchain exp exploded, that's also great, right? That these kind of things happen. You can, have, you can be lucky and unlucky, but within the amount of luck or unluckiness you have, you need to try and be a team player and help the company be as successful as possible. I see this all the time. People in sales going like, 
oh, why do I have to help marketing? Why do I have to help design? It's good. Help the whole company needs to grow together. That's when you really have the ultimate success. And as part of that, and this is something that shouldn't necessarily be in a talk like this when you're talking about it from a corporate perspective, but in startups, you need to learn stakeholder management super early because you have managers and leaders, and there's so many different titles when you join a startup. You've got people who are eight years old and they're freaking head of growth or something. Happens, I've been there, so it happens. You get these titles way too early. There's always someone breathing down your neck. So knowing how to handle stakeholders and get the most out of them is really important skill to learn early. And this is one of the matrices I like to use, that it's important to think about what kind of stakeholders do you have and how do you manage them best. So generally, the two factors that matter and this can be a manager, this can be a boss, or it can be a head of a different department or a lead. It doesn't really matter. If they have a lot of influence within the company and a lot of interest in what you're doing, they're going to be high maintenance. If they have a lot of influence and a lot of interest, you need to almost involve them in the decision-making process. You can't even just do the work and check in with them. Make them a part of it from day one. You have a project and they have a high interest and high influence, get them involved from the start. If they have no influence or no interest, you basically just send them update email every once in a while and they're not going to bother you. When they have a lot of influence but not so much interest, you basically need to not fuck it up. Then you're fine. Otherwise, they will get involved, and I'm sure all of you have been in that project where someone swoops in in the last minute and starts screwing things up. Hams all the time. And then finally, if they have a lot of interest but they're not in a position to influence the project or they don't have, a necessary, let's say, necessarily a reason to be heavily involved, still keep them updated. Keep them informed. And generally, when you, in the startup world, you can, I, I feel you can, box, you can box founders and you can box uh, uh, stakeholders into two categories. You have the visionaries, the people who see the bigger picture. They get very excited, and you need to slow them down. And then you have maybe the, more the pace setters. You have the people who are very hands-on, and you need to kind of be like, hey, back off, you know, take it easy. And you need to make sure that you know the difference between your stakeholders so that you can manage them as well as possible. And I think one way to do this is to think about how you communicate about things. And this is something that was actually developed by a guy called Ike Devenines at Level Up Ventures. And I'd realized that myself and a lot of my friends who were kind of young managers were doing this almost naturally. Uh, but there is a kind of a science to it, which is when you're talking about a project, there's these different factors. You need to talk about the past, the present, and the future. And you need to talk about what are the positive and the negative developments. And this arrow kind of shows how you should do it. You should first talk about the future and the positive. What can we achieve by doing this project? Show them it's important from day one. This is, the, this is the potential of this project. Then you go talk about the progress. How close are we to fulfilling that potential? And then you talk about the wins. These are the things we've achieved to bring us towards that end result, which is the potential I just shared. Then you need to go into the negative. And that's when you start talking about what are the things that didn't work and that we've learned from and that we've acted upon. What are the things currently preventing us from reaching that stage? And sometimes it's you're, you, you're the one who's preventing us. You can say that to your manager in a startup. Be careful with that. Depends. Um, and finally, what are your risks and your concerns? And these are the generally, if you cover all of these bases, you'll generally keep, uh, uh, keep managers quite satisfied. And I think that's where yes-ready responses come into play. I think a yes-ready response is probably the ultimate weapon you can have when you're trying to, be, trying to grow in a startup. Propose things that people can say yes to. They might not say yes, but when people say, oh, we have this issue, what do I do about it? We kind of screwed up, can you help? That's not going to take you very far. But if you say, we have problem A, we have solution B, do we have approval to move ahead? That's the best way to get them to either say yes or propose something else. It brings them straight into the process. So yes ready responses are really, really powerful. And now what comes with all of this, of course, like I say, startup life is super hectic, you need to make sure that you don't overdo it. And what I mean by overdoing it is this is something that I usually say, giving 100% is all good and well, but don't give 120%. Because when you give 120%, and it's super tempting, by the way, because if after one year you go from marketing person, or by the way, I talk about marketing because that's my experience, but it can be sales, it can be development, it can be AI, data scientist, data analyst. But if you go from being an executor to being a lead, to being a manager, to being a head within one or two years, you want to fuel that machine. Because A, it's a huge ego boost. B, it's an ultimate form of validation. And C, it's exciting. You're doing stuff because people think, oh, cool, you're, you're ahead of something after six months, then you're not really ahead. But in a lot of startups, you are. You have that responsibility. You're managing those people. You're deciding things that could influence the fate of the company. And then you feel that need to give more and more and more. 
And that's where I think it's really important to not give more than 100%. Because when you give 120%, the extra 20% produces like 2% extra results. And then you burn out, and it actually leads into a negative. It's really important to avoid burnout. And I'm not going to do a public service announcement here on how to avoid burnout. I've just put the slide here for your reference. This is the slide that took me the longest to make because I wanted to make it from scratch. I don't know why I did that. Um, so choose your time wisely when making things. But just, it really, if you're checking your phone before you've opened your eyes in the morning, that's usually the first sign. That's, uh, it's really important to just keep time for yourself. Don't overdo it because 100% is more than enough. Most people give 60%. That's my experience. Most people give 60% and they go like, oh, that's so hard. You know, it's like that kid that doesn't study for an exam comes up for the exam and says, well, that was a hard exam. If you didn't study and you still got a pass, that was not hard. That's the definition of not hard. So if you give 80% or 90%, you're going to do well. But when you do that 120, 130%, it's when you start getting busy, you're looking for things to do. That's the part to avoid. And finally, you got to hope for luck. And this is kind of the least satisfying part of this talk, but it's also the most important. I think I can talk about all the things that I think I did well and I think I did badly, but most importantly, I was really, really lucky. I was lucky from the point that I was privileged to be in the situation that I was, all the way to every opportunity that I got. There is a luck factor involved. It's always there. That being said, you can create situations to benefit from luck. And I'll give an example. I'll give a couple of examples in a sec, but who here was at the John Romero talk? Okay, a few of you. So he, he, talked about, he talked about how he moved to this part of California where there was a, a community college with the exact computer that he would have needed to learn to code. And of course, there's no doubt, he put in a shitload of work, a shitload of drawbacks. And I'm not here to comment on his career because I can't. He's obviously done amazing things. So he put in the work and he had the talent. But the fact that they didn't kick him out of that university on the first day when he was a, you know, a small kid coding on those computers is a luck factor. But at the same time, there are probably hundreds of thousands of kids in that same area who did not try and who were not there. So to them, that luck factor doesn't mean anything because they didn't care and they weren't involved. So that's where luck becomes kind of this coincidental circumstance thing. You need to be ready to take advantage of it when it's there, but you're also going to need a little bit of it. And luck will usually not determine whether you're successful or not, but it will determine how quickly you are. And I give a couple of examples. Um, a book I would really recommend you check out. It's not 100% you know, dogma truth, but check it out. It's interesting. It's Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And essentially, he talks about a couple of examples. He gives the example of, um, of uh, ice hockey players, how 30 40% of ice hockey players are born in the first three months of the year. Why? Because if you're born in the first three months of the year, you're a bigger kid when they take you into the first ice hockey training in Canada. And because you're bigger, you perform better, so you get extra special attention and special privileges, and then you actually have a higher chance of success. And those born in the last three months of the year have a way lower chance of success. Same as like if you're 170, you're not going to be a basketball player. But it doesn't matter, I'm 196 and I can't play basketball for shit, shit. So you need a bit of luck, but it has to fit your situation. So when you have that luck, you need to make the most out of it. But I just like to always emphasize that it's always going to be a factor. You can be unlucky, and things cannot go your way. It's how you deal with those situations that help the most. Another example is Bill Gates. He was also working in a school where they had just invested in the exact computer that he needed to develop the skills he needed. He still had to do all the work, and he still had to do all of the genius things he did. That's not neither here nor there, but a luck factor is always involved. And I think the sooner, I think it takes a long time, especially me in my early career, I didn't think about the luck so much. I was like, yeah, I'm just working really hard. I'm doing a lot of awesome things, and you know, I want to take all the credit. But there comes a point when you just go like, well, yeah, there's a lot of luck involved as well. So what you do with that, well, hope is basically the only thing you can do, kind of fingers crossed. And if you do have that opportunity, you need to take it. And that's where the risk taking comes into play. When I was a growth tribe, I had an awesome job. I enjoyed it, but I was teaching. And I was doing a lot of teaching. Do we have any teachers here? OK, good, because there's that quote from School of Rock, those who can't do teach. Um, I'm not saying that's true, by the way. I just wanted to check I won't offend anyone. Um, but I was teaching, and a lot of people were like, oh, cool, you can teach marketing, but can you actually do it? And that's actually what led me to leave that job and go to, a, go to Recruity so I can prove that I could do it. But it would have been way more comfortable to stay. And then with Recruity, we grew 400%, and I went from being the only marketing person to having a team of 20 people, and then 3D Hubs came around and said, we kind of want you to build everything from scratch here. And I thought, that sounds kind of cool. And I jumped ship and I went again. And if I'd picked the wrong company, that would have been a disaster and I wouldn't be where I am today. But that's also part of the luck. You can't control it, but if you do have the opportunities, you need to take advantage of it. You need to jump on those trains when they come by. I think that's it.
Thank you. Thank you. That was very good. Guys, uh, I'm probably going to have lots of questions here. Who wants to start? I can start with one. Um, you have talked about um, what kinds of companies and their characteristics. I have found in my career that when I jump from one company to another, that's always a jump in my career too, because I go and do different stuff. And I have always been very lucky in those jumps. I have not never done something wrong, gone to a worse place. Um, so what kind of advice would you give to someone that is in that position? Trying to jump from one position to another, what are the red flags? Well, that's a tough one. I think generally when you're leaving from a position of comfort, you tend to make better decisions than when you're leaving from a position of pressure. So if your contract's ending or you hate your job and you really want to leave, that's when we tend to kind of be, to rush it and then maybe not make the right decision. So I think most people don't want to quit their job when things are comfortable. But if you have the privilege and the opportunities, like if you're, if you're in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sector where there are plenty of jobs, then think about it. If you're comfortable but you want more, is the best time to think about it. It feels a little bit unusual because usually it's when, you know, we're not happy with our jobs or whatever. But generally, it's good to think about opportunities when you're in a position of comfort. And again, I know people who've picked, who've gone to other companies and, uh, and it went really badly. So it's, it's, it, it can happen. I think you need to think about what do you want out of your career? What do you want out of a role? And does that company offer it? If you care about really collaborative uh, culture, try and check if the culture is like that. Talk, check, check them out on, on, on websites like Greenhouse, um, not Greenhouse, Glassdoor, there you go. Check them out on Glassdoor. Talk to people who work there, ask them. Talk to people who used to work there especially, because if they don't work there anymore, it's either because they had another opportunity or they didn't like it. Those are the kind of things you can, you can check. And I would just say, if you're not under pressure to change, take your time, think strategically, pick the kind of role that you think has the best bet. Sometimes you end up with a shitty manager or you're super unlucky, you know, you can't prevent that, but you can try and maximize the success at least. I have more, but I don't want to monopolize this. Um, hi, sorry. Um, I was thinking, ask you about uh, that, what I was thinking you were talking about. Uh, when you have your idea of a project, uh, uh, I don't know how is your experience, but you have, um, so you can ask for funds or you can ask for a co-founder. In your opinion, uh, what is best what do you think is the best? Uh, founder, co-founder with both uh, founds or actually um, call for investors. So what's your idea for the first years of the startup? If you have already everything, engagement, branding, everything. Yeah, um, so if you're in the early stage of a startup, how do you choose between focusing on getting a co-founder, focusing on getting funds, and so on and so forth? Uh, I think it's just basically what you need. Like, do you need a co-founder? Is there an aspect? If you need both, get both. Should, what do you mean by do separately? Should you ask for a co-founder and investors at the same time? Should you ask for a co-founder first and after call for investors? What do you think is the best way? Generally, depends what kind of investment you're raising. So that takes us into a different track. But generally, investors will want to see a founding team. So getting co-founders on board first can help. However, we're raising funds right now. We're at the end stage of our first fundraising, and we have myself and a co-founder, and we're bringing in a third co-founder, and they're okay with it. But we're already two. So I think it depends. The reality is, and this is true like, with jobs, and it's true with startups, like, if they love your idea, and they feel like they're gonna, they get the FOMO, then nothing else matters. Then they're going to get on board. So that's, you just need to gauge a little bit what's necessary. Hi. Um, in your point of view, what do you think, uh, by being a recruiter, 
when employing someone that has a startup or when uh, when uh, when you about to employ or when you already have someone and then in the middle of the job of the year they they tend to start a company how do you think the company looks at these people is it something that you should hide is it some, something you should share is so if you're starting a company while you're working somewhere yeah or when you have to employ someone that has a startup but he can't go full uh, on his own. From a recruiter's perspective? Yes. Um, that's a tough one. Um, if you want them to work full time, don't do it, because they won't if they have their own company. But if it's OK, if you can make a compromise, I guess at the end of the day, it's who, what kind of person are you looking for? Um, and why would somebody with their own company apply? So I think that's, these are the kind of dynamics. So if somebody has their own company and they're applying, what's happening with their company? Is it failing? Do they not like it? Are they waiting to leave? If they say, look, I have a disagreement with my co-founders, I'm leaving in three months, that's okay. Then you, know, then you say, okay, well, for the next three months, you work 10 hours a week or whatever, and then you come in full time. If they're saying, oh, I have a great, super successful company, but I also want a job on the side, that's bullshit, that's not gonna happen. So I guess the, 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 the story matters, and this is kind of what I was trying to, the story is always the most important. If you say, I, it's okay if you took a year off, or it's okay if you have your own business on the side, it's okay if you have some experience or don't have some experience, but you need a story, you need to explain why are things the way that they are? Why did you take some time off? Why did you change your career? Um, an example I, I have is we're hiring a CTO, and we had this one candidate, he spent his whole life in Amazon, Vodafone, big corporates, then he spent eight months at Skyscanner, and then he was CTO at startups for five years. And we saw Skyscanner, we we're like, this guy was at Skyscanner, we need this guy. And then we saw eight months, and we were like, why was he only eight months at Skyscanner? So suddenly it went from something really positive to like, oh, Skyscanner kicked him out, didn't they? But then when we talked to him, he said, I'd worked in corporates my whole life, I wanted to go to the startup world, I thought Skyscanner would be kind of a startup culture, but it wasn't. And so after eight months, I decided to go to an actual startup where I've been super successful. And that story makes total sense. And suddenly, this thing that on paper could be a positive or a negative, it makes sense because of the story. So the same thing goes here. If somebody has their business on the side, it all matters about why are they doing what they're doing. If they're trying to earn a bit of extra cash, but you want somebody who's gonna be a real strategic part of the team, it's probably not the right fit. But if you need somebody who has expertise and they say, look, my company's going slow right now, I have 10 hours a week to help you and I have that expertise, why not? That uh, the same applies to someone that uh, wants to to start a to start a startup in the middle, uh, uh, as if middle of their job. Exactly. Yeah. So during their job, they want to start their own company. I guess it's up to you to judge as a company if you're okay with that. Um, I would ask them why and how do they plan to do it. If somebody does a good job, I generally don't care what they do on the side. Okay. So then just be clear on what your expectations are. But then I also, in my head, if somebody says to me, I'm starting my own company and they're awesome, in the back of my head, I go, okay, in six months, they're probably going to leave. So have that in mind that you might have to hire to replace that person. But they're just an honest conversation and understanding the intentions helps a lot. Okay. Well, I'll bring it up a closed bottle. Any further questions? There's one. Thanks. Uh, hi. hi. So, um, you know, there is like a, a long time ago, I'm, I saw a tweet, I think, uh, there was a nice question where I was asking like, um, for engineers, whatever, who reads that tweet, like how many uh, domains did you register but never throw away, like, never worked on that, like, you know, as a pet project. <laughs> uh, so the question is like, maybe you can give advice, like a couple of steps to start, uh, to, to move forward from a, pet project that you are working on your free time to a startup where you can work on a full time and move out from your full time job. Are you working at his company and you're trying to start your own company? No, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, okay, so how do you turn a side project into a business? Uh, really hard. Uh, I guess why is it still a side project? Um, ask yourself, does it have a business application? Is, you know, do a business model canvas. You know, there's things you can check out, product market fit canvas problem solution fixed canvas, business model canvas. These are all templates you can fill out to kind of help think about your business in a different way. Um, you need to ask yourself what's currently missing, and this is true, like what, what, is, what is preventing this from being a successful business? 
Um, if you have a side project that has traction, people are using it, people are getting the benefit, what is the problem? Is it a lack of marketing? Is it a lack of users? Is it a lack of conversions on the platform? Is it a lack of funding? Is it a lack of rev um, revenue monetization? I think that's kind of the starting point, which is what has prevented this, start, this, what has prevented this side project from exploding naturally? And then you can see, okay, I need to spend more time on improving this feature, or I need to maybe partner with someone who would be a co-founder, who would help with the commercial side of things. I think that's kind of where you need to start thinking. But it's really hard for me to judge because every side project is different, and it depends a little bit how far along you are. Um, if you have a financial uh, cushion, and you can afford to go three to six months without a job, and you're a developer, you'll find another job, and you'll probably get freelance work if you need it, I would always advocate to give your full focus to your own company. Because most of the time, even most of the time, those companies fail. But even if it fails, you'll spin it off and pivot it into something that might be successful. But it's really difficult to do on the side. But then again, I think that might be a personal thing. Like I can't do a business on the side of my job. I've never, I didn't do freelance work. I didn't do any consultancy work when I had a full-time job because I don't like splitting my attention. Um, maybe some people can do it. But I guess you just need to take a step back and ask yourself, what does it really need? And if the answer is it needs more of my time, then maybe you know, take the leap and become an entrepreneur. It's super scary. You know, I quit my job in the middle of COVID to start my own business. And it, it, I've not had the reward yet. So I can only say that think about what's missing and try to work on that. Hi. Um, so let's say you have a nonprofit startup and you're being quite successful at the start. Uh, how would you go about getting those initial investments that you're missing? Non Non-profit as in by choice or you want to make, you want, to, you want your pre-revenue, you mean? Uh, sorry, pre-revenue? So you, do, you, you want to get investors, but you're not growing yet. Well, uh, let's say you're growing um, as you go and you're being quite successful at the early stages. Yeah. You're getting... Um, so this is for a very concrete example where you, you get students and you're getting students, you're getting attention, you're getting feedback, but you're not getting uh, investment. How would you go about that? How many investors have you spoken to in the last month? Well, a few, not many. Maybe that's the problem. Reach out. The best thing, look, I, I came out with, so Reveal is now, we're, we're on the verge, of, we're in the verge of, of raising our first round and stuff, and, and I can't say that we've been successful, but when I first sent out the first version of the pitch deck to investors, I sent it out to everyone. Um, and I was like, this is awesome. And then now I look at it and I go like, what the hell was I thinking? That's awful. The pitch deck is terrible. Terrible. And we have this thing where we've created now 183 versions and it's still called version one on Google Slides. It's still called V1. You will, you will, if you send it to investors and they say, no, this doesn't work, and you come back with an improvement, it's more beneficial because one, they know that you can respond to feedback. And two, they know you. They've talked to you before. So we, we sent this to 50, 60 investors. And we sent it to people who said, we don't really get it. And then we went back to them and they said, oh, now I kind of get it. And we actually had to turn down investment offers after a while. Um, so I think the best thing is to share it with investors because very often they will tell you why it's, why, well, they'll either say, yes, bring it on, or they'll tell you what's missing. And then you need to read between the lines, understand their feedback, and implement it as you go. Um, you said to maximize chances of luck when you are choosing a startup, it's better to do this from comfort place. And from another side, how to choose a good startup? What are the tips to choose a startup with red flags or good promising startup? Oh yeah, so startups, what are the red flags and the, the green flags, the startups? Okay, so some of it will be personal. I think there's just some things that if they're not in the industry that you want, um, things that are red flags. If, a, if you're applying for a job role and they don't treat you well during the process, that's a red flag. If you're applying for a job role and the role name and description changes 100 times, big red flag, it happens all the time. You apply for this, you know, demand generation manager and ends up being marketing manager and it turns up into being this. They need to, be, they need to know what they want. I think that helps a lot um, if you're coming in with clarity. Um, company culture, if that's important to you, uh, it should be, I think, to most people it should be important. Um, really try and get a feel for what the culture is like. Um, 
I don't know, there, there's companies in the Netherlands where if you leave 15 minutes early, it's not common, but there's one or two, if you leave 15 minutes early, you get in trouble or they mention it. You don't want to work at a company like that. Because a startup, the, the startup should take a position of, we're going to pay you way less than a corporate, but you get all these other benefits. If you're not getting those benefits, then, then they're not thinking the right way. Um, there's so many red flags to get. It's really hard to, to, to pinpoint all of them. I would say go with your gut feeling. Most of the time, if you feel uncomfortable with something, it's, there's something there. It, it's most of the time, it's the gut feeling really, really helps. And the more you do it, the more of a gut feeling you get. It's why sometimes applying, even if you don't know if you want to roll, is good, because going through the process helps you learn and you kind of experience it. And then it also develops your gut feeling a little bit and your impression and the way that you interpret this information. In terms of real red flags, them not knowing what they want, them not having a really open culture, um, them not giving you the space to take ownership. Um, these are the sort of things um, that to watch out for. Um, other than that, I would say just go with your gut. Uh, we learn from our failures. What are the most important things you've learned uh, from yours? What are the most important things I learned from? Your failures. My failures. Um, I very rarely look at failures. I'm, a, I'm not really like, like the, I work on an experimental basis, which means I, I screw things up on a daily basis and then I try and fix it. So I guess my biggest learning is to not really, you know, I don't know, we live in a culture where people are like, it's awesome to fail, it's better to succeed. But you know, if you fail, just keep going and keep, don't think about it too much. I, I don't really think about it too positively or negatively. I, I, get, I get shit from my partner all the time. She's like, you never celebrate the wins. I was like, yeah, but I don't really mourn the failures either. I just kind of do my thing and I keep going. Um, I think generally like some specific things where I made mistakes is in how I judged people. Um, for example, uh, if you want someone to be really committed the way I show commitment and the way you show commitment and the way someone else shows commitment might not be the same way. And I think this is a trap we fall into a lot. So we go like, this person is, is, is doing a thing or showing a behavior that if I were doing it would be a sign of non-commitment or boredom or lack of passion or, or whatever. That's not necessarily true. So I think just understanding people, like the difference between extroverts and introverts, I think that's maybe one of the biggest things. In the earliest stages as a manager, I would think of, I would naturally expect, or you'd start thinking, oh, introverted people are less committed or less passionate, just because extroverts are in your face, yeah, that's awesome. And then the introverts are like, yeah, it's kind of good. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're less committed. Um, it's just a difference in personality. I think that's probably one of the biggest learnings. And um, I always try to uh, be objective in that sense. But now I really understand it from my own experience where I've, I've realized that sometimes people who are introverted are more committed and putting in more, they just show it in a different way. And that can apply to a lot of different examples like that. So that's just an example of one. Hello, uh, you talked about uh, specialists and generalists. Um, do you think the, there is a, a better type for startups? Because uh, in a startup you have to do all sorts of work from all sorts of areas? Do you think generalists are better for startups? Specialists are better for corporate because you have uh, many people doing many tasks and one can focus on one task or, or there isn't this uh, Well, that's a tough one. Um, generally, being a generalist will help in the very early stages of a startup. Now, the problem is the word startup, people call Facebook a startup still. Like, it's like a startup, when I mean like really in the early stages. So I always, that's why I talk in the talk about startups and scale-ups. I'm talking companies that are like, you know, 10, then 20, then 50, then 100, then 200 people. Those are still very small companies with a lot of good culture and all this kind of the startup y vibes. In the very early stages, you might be better off as, um, as, a, as a generalist, but very quickly, specialists are needed in most companies. So I would, I would say that if you're a specialist, don't go for a three-person company because you're going you're gonna to have the same culture with more exciting opportunities and way more money at a 50-person company. So this is where, like, this is the area I was going into where I thought, okay, I can go be a, a C-level executive at another five-person company, but then I may as well just start my own. So that's what I did. So if you want to have that early stage experience and you're a specialist with a very particular set of well, uh, kind of like earned skills, then a honed skills, Maybe start your own company. That's maybe something to do. Or find, there's so many commercial people who are looking for technical people. You'll find a co-founder, like basically begging for technical co-founders day in, day out. So what I would say is maybe generally as a specialist, you'll go a little bit later stage startup. 
So not the zero to one, but the one to 10 and the 10 to 100. Um, that being said, it depends on the role. Maybe as a specialist, like specialist doesn't mean that, hey, I'm amazing at React, but I can't read HTML. That's not how it works, right? So being a specialist, you still have some generalist skills, so you can still be successful in an early stage startup. But then it's really good to know how early stage and what do they need. I think this is the, 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 the simplest thing you can do in any kind of career situation is put yourself in the, in the seat of the recruiter. Because I didn't learn much about how to be a good candidate I also haven't applied for a job in the last seven years, but I haven't, didn't learn much about being a good candidate until I started hiring people and went like, oh, it's so obvious when you think about what they need. So I think there's the things you can ask and you can, you can, you can gauge early on in the process. Hi, so I do a lot of volunteer work with people that are unemployed. I help them with their CVs. And right now in the market, we have some people that are employed, but they really want to go into the tech wor world. So they've done some code academies and et cetera. But they're in a stage in their career that they have an income that they cannot lose. And to go into a developer role, they will go into a junior role. So what sort of advice you that are into this business, into this world, you think we can give to these people to close this gap? So you're saying people who are maybe a little bit further in their existing career, but they want to make a change and they don't like starting from zero? Not that they don't like, they just can't because they can't afford it. Wise, yeah. It's tough, right? I don't know, if you can't afford it, then you can't afford it, right? It's a, it's a little bit that. I don't like to sugarcoat things, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess what you can try and do is start working on side projects, part-time work, freelance work. Um, you need to get that feeling. So it's difficult to freelance when you're a junior, when you're starting out, but you can try that. I guess think about projects that you can do, create the opportunities that you can do alongside your work. Um, I don't know what kind of work they do. Maybe they can do that part-time and do another thing part-time. Uh, I have a friend who did, an, who did a code, code course and, uh, and, and a traineeship at a company as a, as a front-end developer whilst working for a hot dog stand. And she did that for eight months. And if you have a lot of financial commitments and you have kids and a mortgage, maybe it's not the best time to change your role. That being said, I'm not gonna be the person who's gonna kill people's dreams, so if they can find a way, they should. Then I guess side projects and freelance work is the best way to do that. But there, if the, this is what I mean with sometimes you're also not in a privileged position, and then it's harder. But that doesn't mean it's impossible, but then, uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult, to, difficult to advise specifically there. Oh, uh, we are going to take just one more. And imagine, it seemed that there were no questions. Hey, how to learn to sell yourself? How to learn to sell yourself? I like to talk, so it's easier for me. If you like to talk, that's quite good. Um, I like to talk and I'm an extrovert, but I, I really can sell myself right. Like, I'm always shy, you know? Well, I guess that there's a certain personal conference. I'll, I'll give you a story where, like, as a, a friend of mine, worked for very product-driven companies and was very involved in product development throughout his career. But he was usually in a more operational role or a project manager role or a strategic role. And he was recently applying for a senior product-centric position. He has all the skills. And then he would go into an interview where he would talk and he'd be like, so he would, he would talk about all his experience and he'd water everything down and play everything down. So he'd say, so for example, he built this product himself on the side of his job, and it had 30,000 monthly users. It wasn't commercially successful, but it had tons of users. He didn't mention it. Like, you built a product, and you're going for a product you know, building freaking job, and you're not mentioning it, then it doesn't make any sense. So I guess the key is to just take down the notes of the things that, if you were on the other side, what do you want to hear, and what can you say to satisfy that need? So you can say, if you have specific things you've achieved, just make sure you mention them. And I guess confidence is something that needs to be worked on. You can try public speaking. You can try applying to jobs that you don't care about so much. That's something I found could be quite useful. So if you have jobs where you go, OK, I don't really want that job. But going in without really caring might give you that comfort to then not be as shy and to just sell, sell like your, your, uh, your, your skills and your experience better. And then maybe then when you translate that into a situation where you do care, you kind of have a little bit of the muscle memory and you have a little bit of the habit. So that's something you could try. Talk to people who are really good at it. 
So, I mean, honestly, the best thing you can find for your career is find someone on LinkedIn who does the job that you want and just write them a message and say, can I buy you a coffee and talk? A lot of people like talking about themselves, myself included, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But like, it, it helps. Talk to someone who's done what you, what you want to do and just say, how did you do this? And then just ask them questions. And very often, you know, that's how, that's how you can find a mentor, or you can find someone who can help. So those are the kind of things I would suggest. But honestly, the most important thing is just, if you know you're good at something, just say it. That's OK. Um, it's difficult, but it's honestly just the best way to do it. You just come out and say, These, this is what the job is. This is what you need. This is why I think I'm a good fit. And then practice. Practice helps. And losing your imposter syndrome helps. Everyone has. I have it now as well, because I was in the marketing world. I was really good at what I was doing. And in the founder world, I don't know anything. So you need to kind of just with time, it gets easier as well. So uh, this was freaking cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a round of applause for Karim. Thank you. If you have further questions, uh, well, you go after him. Uh, that's what around. this event is all about. Okay.